What is the power of makeup? For me, it's everything. It's magic. It's to fool your audience into believing that what they're seeing is 100% reality. The power of makeup is the power of transformation. If you're the wearer of the makeup, it sort of gives you permission to be a different character. Makeup effects and makeup uh, allows actors to tap into different parts of their personality. Whether it's a zombie or a princess or a Frankenstein monster, it's what enables an actor to actually emote. Want to hear something scary? Makeup and hair are the most dangerous people on a set because they get the actors first thing in the morning and they're right in their face. I've seen hairdressers and makeup people just fuck movies. So you always want to be on their good side. Good makeup helps create a good character. And characters are what make a movie interesting. If the makeup is ineffectual, it's going to destroy the whole movie. It has the power to heal, it has the power to inspire, and it also inspires and creates imagination to be able to tell stories. Makeup has given artists and filmmakers incredible freedom. But all that innovation and invention can be traced back to a moment in time when one film proved nothing was impossible. Makeup in film has existed since the turn of the 20th century. Early artists were actors who experimented on themselves. The successful ones were then asked to work on other actors. One of the first breakout artists was Cecil Holland. An early attempt at creating a simian makeup was Holland's work on The Lost World. To me, Cecil Holland was the genesis of it all, the beginning of maybe even the first makeup effects person. Meanwhile, at Universal Studios, the horror genre began to thrive, and with it rose the fame of actor and self-taught makeup artist, Lon Chaney Sr. To me, it all begins with him. There is a bridge between theatrical makeup and movie makeup. He starts it. He did makeups that no one else had ever attempted, and some of them became, you know, legendary. Watching the original Hunchback with Lon Chaney, that was one of those moments where I thought, that's, that is something that I would love to try and emulate. My favorite Lon Chaney makeup was the Phantom of the Opera. I thought that it was just the most amazing transformation I've ever seen. Known as the man of a thousand faces, Chaney propelled the horror genre to new heights. But his untimely death in 1930 created a void in the makeup world that was quickly filled by another actor turned makeup artist, Jack Pierce. If he had done nothing but create Frankenstein's monster, Jack Pierce would have uh, a place in uh, you know, the movie Pantheon of heroes and legends. That makeup is so indelible. It's so recognizable. It's been so much imitated. There have been so many inferior knockoffs of it. But he did it as he did The Wolfman, another extraordinary piece of makeup that didn't have today's technology behind it. Just a lot of hard work and a lot of imagination. Whether it's enhancing the mouth of Conrad Veidt in The Man Who Laughs or doing The Monkey Talks, which is a beautiful precedent to Planet of the Apes in a way, the key comes from studying the face of the actor and saying, okay, what do I need to build? What do I need to take down? I remember seeing the episode of This Is Your Life with Boris Karloff, and Jack Pierce had come out, and he's there with the bolts and all. It was the first time I heard Jack Pierce's voice, and it was similar to what I thought his voice would be, you know, kind of like this scrappy guy. It's wonderful to see you. The oh, best yeah. makeup man in the world. Ah, uh, what, Thank a, what you. A, I owe him a lot. First person that I idolized was Jack Pierce, because he did the Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman, and the mummy classic universal horror films. And those were the films that really inspired me to want to do this. 
As time progressed, makeup became more sophisticated, but the quality of films began to deteriorate. In the years following World War II, science fiction became a popular genre. And there were some notable films, like The Day the Earth Stood Still and The Thing from Another World. Very few serious filmmakers had really approached science fiction, and, and, and there were a couple of attempts in the 50s to make some expensive science fiction pictures that didn't really make as, enough money. After a little while, those films got cheaper and tackier and really became B-movies and kiddie fodder. Nobody will believe the invasion of the saucer men. In the early 1960s, 20th Century Fox producer Arthur P. Jacobs was searching for a project that would astound audiences around the globe. Planète des Singes, or Monkey Planet, was originally published in France in January 1963. Natalie Trundy, who was then Arthur P. Jacobs' uh, girlfriend, had read the book and suggested it to Arthur. By June of 1964, the book had been translated into English and published in America. What a book, right? This whole thing where apes have taken over society and humans have devolved into being the, sort of a lower form of life than the apes was sort of ahead of its time. Richard Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox, helps Arthur Jacobs obtain the option for Bull's novel. Jacobs hires Rod Serling of Twilight Zone fame to write a treatment titled Planet of the Apes in hopes of turning it into a full motion picture screenplay. I was a man, a man from Earth, a reasoning creature who made it a habit to discover a logical explanation and not a beast hunted down by highly developed apes. Rod Serling, he was a genius. They didn't give you the script. You sat down in a meeting and they started to tell you a little about. So by the time they were done, they really had you hooked. Planet of the Apes is just the biggest sheet cake version of a Twilight Zone episode you can find. Serling was busy rewriting the screenplay. He later claimed to have written over 40 drafts. Somewhere in the universe, there has to be something better than man. Rod Serling highlighted a lot of the uh, contradictions of our society, in many cases, uh, the nihilism of our society. And the original script was actually very different from the, the final version of the script, which was then worked on by Michael Wilson. Zanuck and the Fox board calculate a budget of $2 million, a risky bet given Fox's financial situation at the time. The problem, I think, intrinsically was that it was such new groundbreaking motion picture-wise. The studio was very, very uneasy with it. And the only one that really had faith in the whole thing was Richard Zanuck. 20th Century Fox was not in good shape financially. It's been blamed on Cleopatra and apparently unfairly blamed on Cleopatra in many cases. They used it as an overall excuse for some bad decision-making. The screenplay eventually wound up in the hands of one of Hollywood's biggest stars, Charlton Heston. I think that this film would not have happened had uh, Charlton not wanted to do it. He was just the right actor for that part. His physicality was ideal, and he had the gravitas to match the physicality. It was his project. He helped greenlight it. So it was very close to him. Charlton Heston recommended director Franklin J. Schaffner, who he was currently working with on The Warlord. With a trimmed budget, commitments from Heston and Schaffner, and Edward G. Robinson coming on board to portray the orangutan, Dr. Zayas, Jacobs convinced Fox to greenlight a 10-minute screen test in March 1966. Ben Nye was the department head of makeup at 20th Century Fox and he was getting ready to retire, but he agreed to do a screen test. Oh, good evening, Mr. Thomas. Feeling fine, I hope. Considering I've been kept in a cage for six weeks, I'm fine, yes. Prior to this, when you saw a gorilla in a movie, it was either played by a guy in a gorilla suit or it was played by a monkey. 
But the approach here was a little different because the idea was that these ape characters are going to be played by recognizable actors. And so there needed to be a way to allow them to emote. When you see uh, Energy Robinson do the makeup uh, test, it's not there. Even though that's nowhere close to what the makeup actually wound up being, the scene was effective. No one was laughing, everyone took it seriously, and the project was, uh, I think, much more tangible as something that could resonate dramatically with an audience. But Ben and I decided to retire rather than take on this huge project. Though the screen test proved it was possible to portray talking simians in a serious manner, it would take nothing short of brilliance to get Planet of the Apes out of pre-production. John Chambers was born on September 12, 1922, in the south side of Chicago. John Chambers was the son of two Irish immigrants. They grew up in a very rough neighborhood where John found it necessary to defend his sister and his younger brother all the time. During World War II, Chambers trained as a dental technician, but his artistry led him to a career creating facial restoration prosthetics for wounded servicemen at the VA. But it's important that he comes from knowing the human face. It's important that he is reconstructing the human face. Infatuated with the entertainment industry, Chambers wrote a letter to NBC Television Studios asking for a job in the makeup department. So he drives to Hollywood and then finds out that his letter of acceptance arrived the day that he left Chicago. Chambers quickly established a name for himself and was sought after for many of the most popular television shows of his day. Johnny was outrageously unique. There was nobody like him. He was jovial, laughing all the time. But when it came to the makeup, all of a sudden he got real serious. He was stern in a way that it was humorous <laughs> because when he put his foot down, it was always something, wow, you, you, this guy's got some cashews. He had almost a virtual monopoly on most of the prosthetic work that was happening in Hollywood. If they needed something that was in foam latex, they went to John. From his garage studio, Chambers created some of the most iconic makeups of the 1960s. He was a teacher, probably more than anything else. He thoroughly and totally enjoyed what he did. John made a tremendous impact on a whole lot of people, but none more than me. Tom Berman was born on Thanksgiving Day, 1940, at Santa Monica General Hospital. His father, Ellis, met his mother, Dorothy, while attending the Chicago Art Institute. After sculpting bronzes of prominent Nebraskans, Ellis was commissioned to create several monument statues in Lincoln and Omaha for the WPA. When my father finished the monuments he was making in Nebraska, he packed up the whole family and drove to Hollywood, where he got a job at the studios working in the scenic department. And he ended up getting his own room in the prop shop where he specialized in latex, plastics, breakaways, and all kinds of neat stuff. Now your father, Ellis, senior. I mean, he was like a pioneer in, in making rubber pieces, right? Well, he did. He ran the actual foam latex pieces at Universal Studio for the Wolfman. My dad became personal friends with some of the big Hollywood actors at Universal back then, like Claude Rains and Abbott and Costello and Lon Chaney Jr. And sometimes they would come and have a drink at our house. I didn't pay much attention to that. I was too young. But one day he takes me to the set and there was a makeup man on the set who called me over to him and he put a little cut, a little makeup cut on my arm, which was pretty cool. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm with my dad. And he looked at my dad and he said, wow. He said, if you're half as talented as he is, someday you should think about becoming a makeup artist. His name was Jack Pierce. After a number of years at Universal, Ellis opened his own prop shop. Growing up in my family, we all worked for my father, just like a lot of the big makeup families work together. Hollywood's makeup industry had become a family-dominated business, with names like Don, Phillips, and Westmore. 
My father, who was the oldest, Monty Sr., uh, was Rudolph Valentino's personal makeup artist. First became head of Warner Brothers. Ern became the head of RKO. Bud took over Universal. Wally took over Paramount. Frank never really took over a studio, but he was very close with Cecil B. DeMille and uh, did uh, the Ten Commandments. There was a wonderful story about the, the makeup family of the Westmore brother in Hollywood. So I contacted the House of Westmore. I was able to talk to Perth Westmore. Said, why did you come over? Then for the next three, four, five months, I was sitting as a subject. My father called me at work. He told me that he was working at Don Poe Studios and he had a job sculpting up a King Kong gorilla. And come to find out, John Chambers was in partnership with uh, Don Post. While I was there, I found out that there was a, uh, an apprenticeship opening at 20th Century Fox. And uh, John said, I'll call for you. And he did. And he got me an appointment with Ben Nye, the department head of makeup. I went in to see him, nice man. And he gave me some really lousy news. He told me there are over 90 applicants for the job. And one of them is his own son. And I thought, oh, God, here I was this close. And I went home, I was so disheartened, and, and um, I didn't think I'd ever get into makeup. And that night, I got a telephone call. It's Ben Nye, and he says, you want to come in tomorrow morning and start your apprenticeship? Six months later, I'm in Ben Nye's office, cleaning up his makeup station, which I often did. And Ben comes in with Richard Hamilton, who is their uh, assistant department head, and Dick Smith, their lab man, and they look very forlorn. And Ben Nye is saying, I, I didn't think they were gonna go through with this project. And, and Dick is saying, we did everything they want, didn't we, Ben? And, and Richard's saying, no, they don't look good and they're, and they're too stiff. And uh, they wanna bring in Bud Westmore. And he said, because he did the movie, uh, The List of Adrian Messenger. And now my ears are really perked up because I knew that John did that work. I had seen the photographs at his house. I finally just kind of spoke up and I said, John Chambers did it. So Ben Nye says, we'll give him a call, see if he'd like to come in and pick up a script. So I called him and he, John told me, he said, I'm busy right now, I'm making Spock's ears for uh, Star Trek. And I said, well, they want Bud Westmore. And I knew, I knew he didn't like him. He goes, oh, he growls. They wanted Bud Westmore, from what I had heard from Tommy. And he, uh, was listening just as a new apprentice, apprentice. And he's the one that was responsible for telling them to get me, I was available. The following day, he drives up, pulls up with his little Buick, gets out of the car, he's waving at me as I'm coming out of the makeup department. And he says, it's you and me, Tommy. And he holds out this script and I read the title, Planet of the Apes. In the heart of 20th Century Fox Studios was the makeup lab, where John Chambers and Tom Berman were tasked with creating the simians for Planet of the Apes. So our very first day, John and I were standing in the lab, which was 33 years old and a pretty dingy place. But in the middle of the room, there was this uh, two foot by four foot marble top table. And we were making lists of things he needed. So then John turns around and looks at me and he says, Tommy, Let's clean this shit house out. I just started going through all the boxes. I went through the shelves and underneath the tables and I started pulling out all this stuff. And you could see at first, John was kind of being selective. Well, maybe we could use this. And then after a while, I, I see him overwhelmed. He goes, you know what? Throw it all out. Get rid of it. I literally cleaned out 33 years of old makeup stuff. It was loaded with all personal objects. And, it, and I needed a laboratory to work, you know. While Chambers and Berman feverishly worked on the makeup designs, it came time to cast the actors who would populate the Planet of the Apes. My agent said, I've got an interview for Planet of the Apes. Never heard of it before. Sounded like a B movie. So I went to 20th Century Fox. It was really just an interview with Franklin Schaffner. We didn't even talk about the movie. I went home. Hours later, my agent called and said, um, what did you tell him? And I said, what do you mean? What? Is he mad at me? What? You know? And she said, no, you got the film. I got the film. I didn't audition. With an actor like 
Kim Hunter, who had an Academy Award and was a very distinguished actor, Roddy McDowell as well. Asking them to be buried behind makeup was something of great concern to them in the beginning. When the town heard that there was gonna be a major motion picture called Planet of the Apes, they were interested. And then when they heard that Charlton Heston was gonna be in it, they set up Planet of the Apes with Charlton Heston? This must be quite a film. But when they heard Roddy McDowell was gonna be in it, everyone was really impressed. It gave the film class. As the cast began to take shape, the producers turned back to the 1966 test reel for their first choice to play Dr. Zayas. Somebody's knocking on the door, so I open the door and it's Edward G. Robinson. He tells John, he says, well, I have a goatee and a mustache and I, I, I won't shave that off and I'm not gonna wear that appliance. I, I'm claustrophobic, I can't wear it all day. And John's going, oh, yeah, okay, Eddie. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, well, that, that's good, yeah. Well, well, we'll, we'll work on that. And so, okay, thank you, John. He leaves and John goes, he's out of the picture. <laughs> I thought, wow, what power this yeah. makeup artist has. John Chambers was a brilliant artist, so talented, but he had one hell of a temper. My eloquence and adjectives go pretty far. Let me ask you uh, about Chambers. Was he always two-fisted and gruff, or? He was a real tough character. He was, uh, for instance, on Planet of the Apes, Arthur Jacobs and Mort Abrams would come by and they were going to uh, see our progress. John was doing mock-ups on their heads in clay and painting them and putting hair on them. And uh, I asked him if, he, if it would be okay if I sculpted a gorilla, and he said, yeah, Tommy, you do it in the back room back there where nobody's gonna see it, because I didn't know what I was doing. And so I was sculpting this gorilla, and Arthur Jacobs and Mort Abrams came by, and they said, is John here? And I ran up, I was an apprentice, and I brought John back, and they were looking at his the sculptures, the, the mock-ups he did, and they were saying, you know, difficulty is we're gonna have to take one of these faces and put it on a really top actress. And I don't think anybody's gonna wanna wear this. Mort Abrams walks in the back room, and he sees this gorilla. Now, I, the gorilla I'd sculpted was not very good, mm -hmm. but it was kind of humanoid, humanoid ape, and he comes back and he looks at this thing, he says, Arthur, come on in here and take a look oh, at this. Yeah. John looks at me and I knew, you know, <laughs> oh boy, because he'd he, Irish and he just turned yeah, red. red. And so they said, John, come on in here, well, come on in here and take a look at this. See what, take a look, what, what is this? And he goes, that, that, don't worry about it. that's a background mask and we're working on it, but it's not even close to be ready. Come on back. No, John, what we like about this is, it's kind of like an evolutionary ape. It's a little more human. And so I'm feeling pride that they're enjoying it, but I look beyond that and I see John just turning red. He's going purple on me. And they said, well, to, next week we'd like to come back and take a look at your progress, but, let, but give it some of that, a little bit of that. And John said, okay, yeah, 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 I'll do that. Yeah, okay, uh-huh, yeah. So <laughs> they walk out the door and he goes, huh, huh? You and your big, greasy fucking thumb, huh? <laughs> He said, you know what you are? He said, you're a fucking lunch bucket. <laughs> you're a lunch bucket. You're gonna have that lunch bucket glued to your hand all your life. Oh my God. He walks back, picks up the gorilla, smashes it on the floor. And he says, get out, get out. For three days, he'd come up the makeup department. He would check to see what I was doing. and. He wanted to catch me doing so. He was still burning inside. He was trying to find something I was going to... I'm quarter Irish, Irish yeah. I know. Yeah, so I kind of hid out from him for the most part. One day I'm eating my lunch and he catches me. He said, you're eating your lunch early. And I said, well, Ben Knight told me to go to lunch early because I came in early. And he said, yeah, and I had drawn a picture of myself crucified on the wall. And I had a little caption. I said, I can laugh when things aren't funny. <laughs> he took a look at that picture and he goes, just... And he laughs it's so hard that it's like a release for him. The tears are running down his face. And he laughed and he goes, okay, okay, get back in the lab. And we never spoke about it again. again. Never again. With Edward G. Robinson out, the role of the orangutan protector of the faith went to classically trained Shakespearean actor, Maurice Evans. Morris was the actor's actor, you know? He reeked of authority. Maurice Evans was probably the only actor on record who enjoyed getting into the makeup. 
with a growing number of chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas being cast, an equally large crew of artists would be needed to apply the makeups. I happen to have a knack of looking at a person when I meet them, and uh, God gave me a gift. I can read them right to the T, good or bad, you know? And I don't let them know which way, but I found out I could find the, the people that had the salt. At that time, I was working at the third season of Lost in Space. Then they took uh, Ben Nye, he took me off the show, and then I started with John. I got the job on Apes because I was what you would call staff, I guess, in those days over at Fox. So they sent me up. And so on the plane going up, I was sitting with a young lady and her mother, and we got to talking and realized I had made her up on a little test pilot that they were going to do. So anyway, when we get up there, she went to the department and said, I'd like that fella to do my makeup. So I did her makeup while I was up there. The girl was, was Linda Harrison. John Chambers designed the makeups to be like paint by numbers because he wanted to maintain a continuity, a consistency of uh, uniformity. He did not want makeup artists coming in and putting their own signature on the makeups. I took green young men that I saw a certain talent in what they produced in other, other parts of makeup. And I said, These, this guy is an artist. I'd never had any experience working with prosthetics. Planet of the Apes was the first one. Prosthetics was not my thing. I had never done prosthetics. We had two to three weeks of rehearsal where we were putting these appliances on. Well, we had a couple of journeyman makeup artists in the trailers with us who would go up and down and give us pointers or tell us what to do or what not to do or you're doing too much or doing too little. It was kept as simple as possible. We had a full face appliance that had to be prepped, which meant we had to clear out the eye area and the mouth area, and we had to learn how to feather out the edges on the piece. All these people that, that worked with me, that they made that picture with it as it was. I had Tommy Berman, he was a apprentice. He was a man with his two sons and a wife, and they were having a, a rough time keeping bread on the table at that time when he was so young. As an apprentice makeup artist at Fox, they paid me $90 a week, and I had no complaints about that. But when they found out that I was working uh, seven days a week, 16 hours a day, the amount that I was contributing to the making of these apes, they decided to bump me up to uh, journeyman wages. I told them, I'm going to put you down as a lab man, you know, put them into journeyman salary, and I carried them through. He was one of, one of the best people I'd chosen. Before that, I had never had $100 to my name. Now I am well paid, and John and I are ready to go. After years of struggle, misfires, and challenges, Planet of the Apes was finally ready to move into production. The studio didn't have great faith in it, so they were really wrenched down as far as the money is concerned and as far as the amount of days. The first day of our shoot, everyone was very worried. You could hear all the scuttlebutt and everything. This has got to work, or we're all in trouble. We spent six million dollars to be the joke of the town. Schaffner, to his credit, when people were coming from all sides of saying, well, why don't you drop this scene and do it this way, it's cheaper and easier, he resisted. I respected him. He came from television. My start was in television and we talked the same language. And I says, what I need from you is your authority to stop a shot and say we have to take it over on account of something I saw. And I says, can I stop camera? He said, yeah. Working in the lab, it was a struggle every day to keep up with production. And we were working around the clock. We couldn't have worked any more hours. 
In those first couple months, it was really tough. The guys were working hard, you know. And I came in two at night, and I found the guy asleep on the chair, you know, a chair he was so fatigued. Oh, man, you know, we worked not just five days, but Saturday and Sunday, you know. One time I asked, well, am I going to get some help? And they said, nope. I said, what do you want me to do, put a broom up my rear and sweep the floors as well? John Chambers was on location, and he was leaving to go back to the studio, and he knew how hard I'd been working. And he said, you know, he says, you've been really busting your butt. You take off tomorrow. You sleep late, you just stay home. Four in the morning, the pounding on the door. Get up and get dressed, you're going on the set. I said, well, John told me I can have the day off. No, 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 he's not here and we are. Our call was 2.30 for seven o'clock on the set. They, they stumbled and were slow and, and everything, but it was in the middle of the night. It was rough. We worked and worked and worked to get those edges covered. And then we laid hair over them. We had to work with straight human Asian hair, black, which is the hardest thing to work with that I've ever found. Tom spent a lot of his day in the lab with Werner and Vern Langdon. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have makeup. I created an assembly line. I had him working through the night a shift putting rubber in the oven 11 o'clock at night, taking it out in the morning. You know, no one ever did this before, see? I think on Ronnie McDowell, at one time we were down to one mask ahead for the next day's work. If the run in the oven went bad, which they do many times, uh, the following day we're screwed. Working the lab long hours was bad enough, but then having to go to the set and work there was completely exhausting. But Every day was a thrill. Getting up in the morning was a thrill. The whole day was a thrill because I knew I was working on something special. We had a lot of little problems that we resolved by working together on it. It was great. It was like a, a club. People excelled, absolutely excelled. Every time you turned around, it was a, another huge obstacle. It just was constant push, push, push. Probably the greatest effort I've ever seen in the motion picture industry. The actors had to eat. The actors that were in all of the makeup. One of the gorillas was supposed to be driving a wagon. It looked fine, but as soon as he took the reins and he snapped them and he yelled real loud, he opened his mouth real big. The whole front part of the bottom piece broke loose. I looked down in there and I see peas like peas that you eat. From that point on, they served milkshakes at lunch, anything with a straw. We were at the bottom of the Colorado River, and base camp was way up on top. And we moved everything down with us, and they forgot straws. Well, that doesn't mean too much to the average person, but for Kim, Roddy, Morris, and me, we couldn't we couldn't drink. So Heston says, you don't have any straws? Where are the straws? They, they're back at the base camp. He ran back to the base camp and brought straws back for us. So, you know, that just lets you know what a, what a great common guy he was. Kim Hunter was the queen of the set. <laughs> she was articulate and like Roddy, just a super actor. Maurice Evans, who played an orangutan, played chess, and I played chess. We found ourselves sitting outside Fox back lot, and the two of us were looking at each other just like, this is normal, everyday thing. I remember my superior, Doc Merman, he said, well, we go into dailies, we gotta watch this piece of junk again today, you know, 15 minutes of this, he says, you know. I said, well, don't underestimate what, what an ape can do, you know? <laughs> to ensure the locations would be as groundbreaking as the makeups, production designer Bill Kreber created Apes City, shot on Fox Ranch in Malibu Canyon. I always loved Ape City because everything was rounded and had these soft curves to them that, that looked 
primitive but functional. For the final beach scene filmed in Malibu, the makeups and heavy costumes had to be worn in 100 degree heat. I think it was uh, Charlton Heston's idea to helicopter us all in. So we all met at 20th Century Fox, there's a helipad there, and we were helicoptered to the actual set. Then we had our makeup started. You knew they weren't comfortable. We tried to keep everybody as comfortable as we could, but it wasn't easy. When we finally wrapped Planet of the Apes, it was, I, I guess it was bittersweet because, you know, you've been, I'd been so involved for eight months without a day off. It totally consumed my life. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to get up at 3.15. I wouldn't be seeing all my friends that I worked with, and I'd made a lot of friends on that show. And it was a very strange feeling because I wanted to continue doing that. I would continue doing just what I was doing, what I'd been doing for eight months. When they said that's a wrap for the last time, <laughs> I left there, I thought, I don't ever want to do another appliance as long as I live. Planet of the Apes was a real team effort because all of us were brand new at applying this amount of appliance work on a daily basis. But when you look at what is going to end up on the screen, the worst makeup job is going to represent everybody. The best makeup job is also going to represent everybody. Filming of Planet of the Apes wrapped on August 10, 1967. It was now in the hands of the post-production team, including Jerry Goldsmith, who was composing the iconic score. John told me, he said, you know, they're going to have a rough screaming, and you want to go to see it. And I think Wes Dawn, the other apprentice, and I, I said, yeah, well, let's go see it. I was devastated because I never saw a movie without color correction, <laughs> without music, you know, with just temp music, yeah. missing scenes. Yeah. And I came back and John said, what do you think, Tommy? <laughs> huh? Huh? What do you think? And I'm, I'm terrified to tell him that I think it's one of the worst things I've ever, ever seen. The actors look great, but the rest of the movie looked terrible. Planet of the Apes also required considerable ADR, or dubbing, due to the muffled voices of the actors in makeup. Doing the looping. Franklin would give direction, and then he had a golf cup, and he'd putt. And then, okay, go ahead, Lou. <laughs> so Danny Strepek gives me a gorilla mask and tells me to uh, take it over to the scoring stage. When I get there, Jerry's in the middle of scoring the film, and I was just blown away because I never heard anything like it. And Jerry wanted to wear the mask for inspiration while he conducted his orchestra. It's a very unusual score. I mean, that was another thing about Jerry was that he loved to take chances and he would use orchestrations and combinations of approaches that ordinarily wouldn't probably be considered by most people. It all coalesced. That doesn't happen very often. To bring all those divergent talents together into one, I call it a column of creativity. Planet of the Apes was completed near the end of 1967 and slated for a March 1968 release. The biggest fear we had was, will they laugh or accept the apes? But I thought, if they laugh, this is going to be a Mickey Mouse. 20th Century Fox had a lot riding on this movie. And the rumor around the lot was that if this thing was a flop, that they would be in tremendous jeopardy. Hundreds of technicians and the largest number of makeup artists ever assembled assisted the producers, the writers, the director, and the cast. I didn't really think it was gonna be that big, no. But I know it had been tried before, and it was a flop. Planet of the Apes, beyond your wildest dreams. I was fortunate enough to get a ticket from 20th Century Fox to go see their premiere opening. I sat dead center in the theater, and once I saw that gorilla come up in the cornfield, that big zoom shot, I went, oh my god. The reveal of the gorillas is still absolutely extraordinary sequence. You see the sticks, 
and you see the people running, and the astronauts are like, what's, what's up, you know? You started to get really into the movie, and then as you were into it, you realized, wait a minute, I'm, I'm relating to these, they're, they're apes. You didn't even think about it. Charlton Heston looked more animated than the apes did. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! As soon as we saw the apes, I, 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 was, I just stared and stared, trying to figure out, how did they do that? It's hard for people to imagine now what a massive, mind-destroying thing it was to see apes talk. It blew me away because all of a sudden you're seeing chimpanzees and you're seeing uh, orangutans and you're seeing gorillas. But I think what people still to this day talk about is that amazing ending where he's home all the time. That stunned people, that shocking ending, and they play it without any music. All you hear is the ocean lapping up on the shore and he's it's just screaming his guts out. And then you get a point of view shot which pulls back and you see the Statue of Liberty in ruins, blown to pieces and rusted and decrepit. <laughs> it's so devastating because the symbol is not accidental. It's, a, it's liberty. It's everything that was good about the world that is destroyed. It said everything I believed in. Um, we were living in an era where we were still afraid of the bomb. Of course, we are now, today, but it was very prevalent then. And this script said, you know, you idiots, you keep fooling around and you're going to blow everything up. I was so moved and so um, proud to have worked on this film. It was like the highlight of my life to be able to sit and watch something that I had given so much of my uh, time and effort trying to make my part the best I could. Just three months into what was already shaping up to be the most tumultuous year of the 20th century, Planet of the Apes premiered on March 27, 1968. Everything about a movie is who you are, how old you are, who you're with the first time you see it. And when you ask people for one of their favorite movies or something, not only can they tell you about the movie, but you say, where'd you see it? They'll tell you the theater. My mom dropped us off. It was at a little theater in Santa Ana. And um, <clears throat> we ran out to the car and said, we want to see it again. When Planet of the Apes came out, that's all people talked about. It was pretty intense. I mean, they lined up to see this movie. You, you really don't know what to think of a film called Planet of the Apes. You don't think it's going to tackle such important things. It was the kind of film everybody wanted to see, that everybody buzzed about. It was a, a film that made an impression. How could it not? There was something magical, funny, whimsical, poignant. The worldwide nerve that it struck, besides the story, which is incredible, and there's so many subtext to it as well, the, the makeups were pretty outstanding. As everyone in this industry is going to tell you, Planet of the Apes was a complete game changer, where the makeup was such an integral part of telling of that story. If the makeup didn't work, the film wouldn't have worked. It would look silly. In the makeup world, they was revolutionary as sound coming to film. Thinking back to day one, when John Chambers pulled up in his car and waved at me, getting out and he says, it's you and me, Tommy, holding a script. And it was Planet of the Apes. And he says, I'm gonna win the Academy Award. And I thought, come on, the Academy doesn't even give awards for makeup. 
This year, the Board of Governors of the Academy has voted a special award for makeup. Would John Chambers please come out here and get his award? <laughs> Mr. Chambers is responsible for making monkeys out of Roddy McDowell, Morris Evans, and Kim Hunter, the Planet of the Apes. and quite brilliantly, too. Will one of the friends of Oscar back there please bring Mr. Chambers his award? That's what I call a terrific makeup job. <laughs> How can I follow and act like that? <laughs> may I thank the Board of Governors for this wonderful honor? And may I thank Mr. Zanuck, and Mr. Jacobs, and Ben Nye and Dan Strepek, who share this award with me, I say. But most of all, all those wonderful makeup men and hairstyles that work so hard to make this picture a success. From all of us to all of you, God bless you and thank you so much. John Chambers wanted to acknowledge all the makeup artists that work for him. So he went to a jeweler and he got this jeweler to make these little gold and silver ape heads. The gold ones went to the makeup artists who did the principal actors. This was a gift from uh, John Chambers to all of us who started and finished on the movie. And I've treasured this over the years. This was John's way of sharing his Academy Award with all of us. With Planet of the Apes a financial and critical hit, and having proved that nothing was impossible, a new generation of makeup artists were inspired to join the craft. The first time I even heard about Planet of the Apes, actually my parents had a subscription to Life magazine. They had a picture of Maurice Evans in the makeup. I turned the page and saw this amazing orangutan on the sky, you know, what the hell is this? You know, it's so cool. I remember learning about Planet of the Apes in a Famous Monsters of Filmland. It was just such an amazing thing to see that process in a, in a magazine, the step-by-step -step process. I knew then that I was thinking, I, I have to get into that. And that's when I started playing around. The first makeup was the Planet of the Ape makeup. You know, it was so much fun doing. It has this ability to intrigue every makeup artist. I don't know one makeup artist that has been like, please. Planet of the Apes. It, it just left this permanent mark uh, uh, that I really wanted to be part of, and, and, and it was the only thing that, that I ever wanted to do since I was a kid. My first ever movie was a Super 8 with my Planet of the Apes uh, figures. I think the studio, Fox, was really uh, surprised, taken aback by just how many people uh, fell in love with this movie. Tremendous, tremendous reception to the film. Uh, particularly Fox when they started seeing the coffers fill up. And the studio went sequel, sequel, you know, right away. The pressure on us was to come up with something as groundbreaking and as unusual and original like the very first Planet of the Apes. Production of Beneath was difficult due to Charlton Heston only being willing to work one week and Fox battling producer Richard Zanuck eventually leading to his firing from the studio. The script for Beneath the Planet of the Apes called for humans to live under the surface of the Earth. These humans were mutations. When John Chambers set up his makeup lab, I would go over there and, and there was, originally it was just John and Mr. Berman and Werner, 
And I would go over and hang out there because it was so cool. You know, I'm a famous Monsters of Filmland kid. So to be with, they had all this stuff. And in that movie are mutants. I watched all the prototypes and there were a couple that were so gross. There was one that had teeth coming like, yeah, we really malformed and was so grotesque, it literally made you sick. I think we came up with half a dozen or so sculpt different sculptures of different uh, uh, mutated people. And what I noticed was we were, in the script, they were supposed to be able to take their normal faces and peel them off to reveal that they were mutated. Well, I kept looking at these heads that we were doing, and these heads were so distorted, you'd never be able to put a face over it. Somebody saw the book Grey's Anatomy that had an illustration of a guy in there with all the veins and muscles and everything showing, and went, whoa, that's it, because that we could put a thin skin on and make it look like the person underneath, so when they pulled it off, it would marry to it beautifully. Beneath the Planet of the Apes turned out to be a very successful sequel. And if Fox was surprised by the success of the original, I think they were even more surprised by the success of the sequel. So there was an immediate need to keep the story going. At the end of Beneath, the Earth is destroyed, seemingly ending the Planet of the Apes franchise. By sending apes back in time, a whole new world of opportunities was open. The cleverest of the follow-up pictures is Escape from the Planet of the Apes, which is a time travel picture in, in which the apes go back to 1973 and are harbingers of what's going to happen in the future. And of course, there are uh, people who want to stop them from breeding and make sure that that world of apes, apes conquering man never happens. Uh, and it's a really cleverly plotted movie, and, and it's my favorite in the series just because it's so much fun. It has an ending that could have only happened in the 70s, where, like, well, how do you want to end it? Let's shoot a baby. Okay. <laughs> Planet of the Apes is the first major franchise outside of James Bond that was successful in its sequels. I ran out to every single one of them. My favorite is Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, which, to my knowledge, was shot on the Century City uh, grounds after 20th Century Fox had sold their backlot. I was at the University of California, Irvine. I was a pre-med student. Um, I looked out the window one day, and I was in my chemistry lab, and I saw a film crew on the set and apes running all over our campus. And it was Conquest for the Planet of the Apes. And so I told my lab partner, hey, finish up here. I'm going to go pay a visit. And I met Jay Lee Thompson on the set. Had lunch with him, and then six months later, I was Cornelius on Battle for the Planet of the Apes. I knew Jay Lee Thompson. And Lee said to me, I'm doing another Apes movie. And I said, oh, good, you know. And he said, why don't you be in it? I said, I'd love to be in it. He said, OK. So I, I mostly cut out of it. I'm a face on the cutting room floor in that movie, although I get pretty big billing right in the main title. But uh, I played a human slave to Roddy McDowell. No cracks. But I got a lot of shit for it, you know, especially from Roddy. The role of Cornelius wasn't really going to be that significant until they realized that they had a you know, sentimental storyline. After a few days of watching Roddy work up close, I noticed that his makeup was more expressive, more pliable than many of the other characters. And so I asked my makeup artist, Jimmy Phillips, how it was that Roddy could do this little nose wiggle thing that was unique. And he said, well, that's a secret. And I said, I know, but I'm his son. I should be able to do the same thing that he does. And he said, well, if you can get Roddy to tell you the story of how that gets done, I'll do it for you. And so I was brand new in the industry, a little intimidated, but I went to Roddy and said, look, Mr. McDowell, I'm playing your son. I should have a characteristic similar to yours. Would you agree? And he said, yeah, what do you got? I said, how do you do the nose thing? And he said, tell Jimmy 
to hollow out the inside of the appliance. The following day, I got on the scene. He was in the shot, and I did the little nose wiggle, and it was, it was well received. They still had other ideas for how to expand the Apes universe, and they brought Planet of the Apes to television. When they did that, they, first of all, managed the biggest coup, which was to keep Roddy McDowell as part of the cast as a brand new character, Galen, a chimpanzee on the run because he helps two marooned astronauts. I was involved in the TV series, and uh, we tried to adhere within budget constraints to what was done in the original pictures. In fact, we probably had to do on a percentage basis more appliances than masks because of the TV medium being so close. Danny Strepek called me up and he said, uh, Fred, I want you to do the Planet of the Apes. We're doing a TV series. I says, really? He says, yeah, you're gonna do Roddy. I started working on Roddy and it was just heaven on earth. Rodney McDowell, when they called a rap, he would say, uh, are you sure? And they say, yes, that's a rap. And he would go <laughs> and tear the whole thing off in one piece. The physical challenges of production, I think just it was impossible to do on a weekly basis. Despite its popularity, the Planet of the Apes TV series is canceled after just one season. An animated series follows, but also only lasts a year. This would be the last Apes project produced by Fox for over 25 years. John called me and asked me if I wanted to uh, go into partnership with him to open the very first independent makeup studio. He said I could also bring my brother with me. We were going to be doing motion picture and television work, but that was only our cover. It was our job to help the CIA create quick change disguises. John stayed with them all the way up till the 1980s. We all knew that he was working on something secretive. There were six people when the Iranian embassy was overrun that had gotten away. John Chambers and Bob Seidel created a fake movie just to get these people out of Iran. The details of John Chambers and the CIA's involvement in the Canadian caper remained classified until 1997. The full extent of their mission wouldn't be revealed until 2012, when Argo premiered to critical acclaim, winning the Academy Award for Best Picture. John. One day he came in, he was real grumpy, and he looked torn, he looked beaten, he looked downtrodden. I said, what's wrong? And he said, well, I've been diagnosed with uh, Hodgkin's disease, which is lymphoma or cancer, blood cancer, and I need you guys to buy, my, buy me out. Well, my brother and I had to scrape every dollar we had to be able to buy him out. We found out later that the whole Hodgkin's disease was something he just made up because he wanted us to buy him out. The first film produced after Chambers' exit was Phantom of the Paradise. Despite having no involvement, John Chambers was given full credit for the production due to his status as an Academy Award winner. After we bought John Chambers out, it was tough finding work. We didn't have any contacts. And my brother and I really couldn't afford to keep two families going on what we were making, so we decided to flip a coin to see who was going to take over the studio. I won. And I did several things, and it started getting a reputation. Things started to work real well. And then John Chambers calls me to ask me if I would like to uh, work with him on The Honor of Dr. Moreau. You know, his ego got out of check. He was overbearing, harassing people. It was really miserable. It was tough on everybody. Even Danny Strepek, who had been his friend since NBC, and he didn't speak to him again. And I didn't speak to him for years. After changing the name to Berman Studios, Tom and his team began working on some of the greatest films of the 1970s and 80s. It's guys like Tommy who had the creative juices in their hands and in their brains that create these pieces. 
We were in survival, and we just did anything and everything we could. Everything that came past us, we grabbed onto it. Tommy's talented. He comes from a talented family. His brother, his dad, you always expect the quality. By the late 1970s, Berman Studios was one of the top names in the makeup business. At this point, Tom Berman had partnered with makeup effects artist Stan Winston. We just hit it off right on day one. There was something about Stan that was tremendously inspiring. Tom Berman and my father, Stan Winston, were kindred spirits. Two incredibly creative, incredibly goofy individuals who happened to love monsters and monster makeup. By the end of the 1970s, I decided to push for a title I had been using called Special Makeup Effects. Nobody else used it, the union didn't like it, John Chambers didn't like it, but I didn't find anything that described what I did any better than that title. So I started using the title, along with Stan Winston was the only other one that backed me up. I also pushed really hard to create a category for makeup at the Academy because they were very resistant, but you could see everywhere that makeup was, uh, was very prominent in so many films. The first annual Academy Award for Makeup was presented in 1982. Because of the importance of Planet of the Apes on the art form, Kim Hunter was chosen to present the award with horror icon Vincent Price. The winner is Rick Baker for an American Werewolf in London. In California, there were only three guys. I mean, there was Rick Baker, Stan Winston, and Tom Berman. And they were doing everything and innovating. Tom is the mainstay of our industry. He is a creative force that everybody recognizes. Everybody knows the Berman name. He is one of the main people in our, in our industry who gives us material to look at and to draw inspiration from. One of my favorite directors to work for was Richard Donner. We did. Um, Goonies, we did Scrooge, Lethal Weapon. Making a movie is a bitch. You run into all kinds of trials and tribulations, forgetting the fact that they delivered the best, the Bermans. They were just a pleasure to be with. Going into the 80s were some really interesting years, and that's where I met you, 1980. And we did um, Cat People together, remember? I do remember, and it was very magical, and you, you allowed me the freedom to help you design Natasha Kinski's transformation, and our journey began. Yeah, I wanted a feminine approach, not a real masculine, heavy approach. That's why I was delighted to have you there, and we've... Uh, we've been collaborating ever since. Yeah, we've been collaborating ever since. You always know where we're going, and I'm a detail fanatic. So. You are, you are. She loves to get those little tiny edges and those little parts and pieces, and... and uh, you know, we do our dance around yeah. somebody as we... Uh, it's very magical because yeah. we, we just sort of, when an actor's in our chair, we just sort of know how we work and, you know, you always know where we're going and then I am obsessive about making sure all the details are perfect and it's a blissful yeah. marriage, partnership, and journey. It's been, been great. I'm giving you a kiss. In 1988, on the 20th anniversary of its original release, Fox began discussing a remake of Planet of the Apes. But the film would spend over a decade in development hell before director Tim Burton joined the project. I need to take a sabbatical. I need to get away for a while. I get a call from Tim Burton saying, I'm going to do Planet of the Apes remake. I'd like to talk to you about doing it. And it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know? Rick Baker and Stan Winston vied for the highly coveted position of makeup designer. My dad wanted so badly to put his stamp on the franchise, and he lobbied for it hard, and he and I got our life cast done, and they sculpted these incredible ape makeups. Dad was an elderly chimp. I was a young chimp. It was a dream for me to be able to perform with my dad, but I know it was a dream for him because he came out to Los Angeles to be an actor. And here was his opportunity to act again. Despite Stan Winston's effort, Rick Baker was selected to create makeups for this new vision of Planet of the Apes. 
I was very pleased with the makeups that we did and was pleased with the amount of the makeups that we did and the quality of them. Released in 2001, Planet of the Apes opened to mixed reviews. And despite being a commercial success, it was unable to match the original. The big films started to go more to the larger studios like Stan Winston's or Rick Baker's or Greg Canham's. And uh, Barry and I started to do a segue into television. We, we didn't want to leave home because we had a brand new baby, Max, and uh, it was perfect for us. We did things like the Tracy Ullman show, where we only had to work one day a week. We could prep all week. And we did things like Chicago Hope, and we did the pilot for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and CSI, and we eventually wound up doing Nick Tuck. And we decided at that time we wanted to bring motion picture quality to television. Greer Shepard, Brian Murphy's producer, came to us and said that the studio greenlit Nip Tuck because of the work we did. There's always a range of people that can make something delicate or expressive, you know, uh, and I think that uh, Tom could run the gamut and make something that was so naturalistic that nobody knows its makeup. I feel that Tom took a, a different approach to a lot of things than other makeup artists would. They did so many fantastic things for TV, and I'm sure it was like, uh, you know, hellacious because TV has such quick turnarounds. So he really made it possible for that to happen on TV. The Bermans did an amazing job. I think that really laid the way for a lot of the shows. Throughout his career, Tom Berman has been not only an inspiration, but also a mentor to makeup artists. I've been looking for someone to uh, um, teach what I knew. I mean, it's not like we didn't have people through the years, a lot of people. Vince was insatiable, and he wanted to learn everything. I decided to retire. Vincent came here at that time. It was easy just to hand it over to him. The day the Berman Studios became VVDFX was, it, it was kind of an emotional day for me because I joke and I often say that it was almost like moving back into your parents' house after you moved out. I've always wanted to open up my own studio. Taking these steps into making that happen just came full circle into me renting the space and, and being here. It was, it, was, it was such an amazing feeling. Despite makeup finding a place in the hearts of a new generation of artists, the industry began to shift towards digital effects. Ever since I can remember, there are these naysayers about the future of the motion picture business, especially makeup, because of the digital era. And uh, I don't see it. I see makeup's just gonna keep growing and it's gonna keep changing. But there's a lot of fear around that. I said, you know, eventually they're not going to need makeup artists. They said, what do you mean? Oh, you're full of crap. I think they're gonna go CGI route. I see basically the end of makeup as we know it today. Bolstered by the success of digital studios, such as Weta and ILM, Fox greenlights a new Planet of the Apes film. This time, it's a reboot. The new Planet of the Apes, what we did is that we made all the apes digital this time. And you know, one of the funny things is that when we were doing the first one, a lot of my friends from Los Angeles, you know, heard that we were going to be doing it, and they said, oh, fantastic, you know, you're finally going to get to work on a Planet of the Apes film. So, you know, what, what kind of prosthetics you're going to use and everything, I thought, actually, no prosthetics this time, it's all going to be digital. But it's a, a completely different approach, completely different, really, type of film. I wanted to hate the Planet of the Apes that they did when they did it with all computers. But I was actually pretty blown away by what they did. By 2018, three all-digital Planet of the Apes films had been released and grossed over $2 billion at the box office. Entertainment is evolving faster than we can imagine. And digital technology is the vein through which that lifeblood is going to flow. There's no, we, we can bang our heads against the wall and say, no, there'll always be prosthetic makeups, or no, it's better to blend the two. We can bang our heads, we can, we, we can do whatever we want, but it's coming. I love CGI, I'm all for it. If I do an age makeup, trying to do it every day, you're gonna make mistakes, little things. I, I think a lot of people are so 
afraid of CGI and things taking over and the makeup effects world being this dying art form that will, you know, just go down. I just don't see any of that happening. I see it as busy as it has ever been right now. Artists like Vincent are our future because he appreciates the past. Most makeup artists that I know, they always refer back to the originals, the classics, which Planet of the Apes, of course, is. Tom, this is the first time we've talked in 48 years. Wow. And I'm still mad at you. Yeah, <laughs> you should be, you should be. Uh, it seems like yesterday. I know. Part of me, it just seems like I can go back and visit that moment and get all excited all over again. When the conversation first came up of putting Lou Wagner back into a, a Planet of the Apes look, that was a very exciting phone call. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to take somebody from that film this many years later and transform him into a, what really got me is into his character now. Jake makeup after 50 years brought back a lot of memories of John and our falling out. Those years when I tried to contact him and couldn't, didn't know where he was. And then I heard he had a stroke and he was in a motion picture home. I was fortunate to meet John Chambers. Kind of felt like he was in the witness relocation program from, from my perspective for a while. It's like he disappeared. He was completely off the radar. And then I heard that he was at the motion picture home. I said, what if we do a party for John? Because it's been, at that time, 30 years since he worked on Planet of the Apes. And I'll bring in people he worked with. But he'll also meet people he's never met before. People who were influenced by what he did in those movies in terms of their makeup. Oh boy, when an Irishman hasn't got words to say anything. <laughs> and it just so happened that it was the day before his 75th birthday. Happy birthday he was pretty impressed that we had all those people there, because it was a lot of his friends and colleagues and peers. You spark the imagination of an army of kids who are now the eminent and renowned of your field. I'm afraid that you have to settle for the reality that you are an icon. Dr. Zira, I believe Chambers would like a kiss. Oh. <laughs> you probably couldn't predict this, but there was a great thing that happened for our industry that day, is there were a lot of folks that hadn't seen each other in a long time. And maybe some old grudges were left behind that day. I think it was a good healing time, I think, for the industry. <laughs> After Scott Essman called me and told me that they were throwing a 75th birthday party for John Chambers, I was a little 
ambivalent about going because I had a lot of unfinished business with John. We had kind of separated in a way that I hadn't spoken to him for years. I had tried to get in touch with him many times. I never got an answer, so I went. But to see him in a wheelchair it was pretty moving for me. All of a sudden, I, I, I saw him in a whole nother light. He didn't have that bombastic presence any longer. He, you could see that he'd had a stroke, and you could see that one side of him was somewhat paralyzed. And it was, um, I kind of stayed in the back and watched everybody as, as they congratulated him. And people filed by, and they shook his hand, and they got their picture taken with him. And uh, it was, after, after a while, he, he looked over and he saw me. And uh, he, he called me to his side. And, and he said, you're the one I'm most proud of, Tommy. And, and we looked in each other's eyes, and both of us had tears. And it was over. The anguish, the past, it was gone, finished. John Chambers died in August of 2001 at the age of 78. Johnny? Hmm. I loved him like a brother. And at times I got so damn mad at him, I could have killed him. He was like a father to me. He was my teacher, and he taught me about life. He taught me about people. He taught me the skills that I needed, the entrepreneurial skills I needed to be on my own. He made a huge difference in my world. One thing we never expected when we were working on Planet of the Apes was the huge fan base. I'm still shocked and surprised that there are such avid fans. If you're a fan of Planet of the Apes, you're a dyed-in-the-wool fan. If you go to conventions like Monstrapalooza, you always see Planet of the Apes characters. And the fans don't spare any expense. They have the shoes with the, the ape paw print, and they have the, the full head-to-toe costumes. Mostly, they make themselves. I've been a fan ever since I was a child. When I hear the opening music, it's just like I'm you know, 11 years old again. We pretty much did everything ourselves. I mean, down to making our own shoes, our own costumes, doing our own, own makeup. This is why I love uh, science fiction and horror movies so much. It's all Planet of the Apes. If the Planet of the Apes franchise didn't have an absolutely committed and dedicated fan base, it wouldn't have sustained itself for the 50 years that it has. Um, Star Trek's been around nearly as long. Uh, Star Wars fans, they're all extremely dedicated to that particular franchise. And the Apes fans, I find, are enormously intelligent. Original memorabilia from the Planet of the Apes franchise, including prosthetics, costumes, and props, have become relics among collectors. Collecting film artifacts and television artifacts has grown exponentially. I've been very fortunate because I've saved a big chunk of the history of Hollywood, right? In my career, I've probably handled almost everything that survived from Planet of the Apes to whether it's the lawgiver, the bleeding lawgiver. I've had every costume, every principal actor, you know, makeup heads, background apes, prosthetics. I don't think there's something we haven't had.
The 50th anniversary exhibit that we have here on display at the School of Cinematic Arts is an attempt to really bring together as many facets of the Planet of the Apes universe really as we can to show and celebrate the original films alongside the amazing achievements of the contemporary films. I think the work that Tom and John did on Planet of the Apes was uh, absolutely a turning point in, in film history. When people say they don't have influences, they're lying. Because everything you see influences you. And I know that I took something from Planet of the Apes. It's a very successful tale, well told. It's that world of fantasy. It seems to hold an audience for generations to come. If I'm ever asked what some of my favorite projects are, I would always come up with the very first one that almost everybody in the world knows about. It was the original Planet of the Apes. It was singularly the best film I was lucky enough to do. It's the proudest I am in my 50-year career. I hope that 50 years from now that people will look upon our sequence of films with the same amount of respect and nostalgia. I'm honored that people love the movies I've worked on, and I've worked on hundreds. But when I look back, the greatest moment in my career was John and I standing at that marble top table making apes. Thank you.